Hello, and welcome to another presentation of Strategic Energy Group's Building Operator Smart series of training videos. And remember, for additional energy reducing tips in your buildings, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button. And my name's Steve Hathaway, and I'm an energy coach with the Strategic Energy Group, and I'll be presenting today's video. This video will address number three of the four common opportunities we find in buildings. In this two-part video, we discuss the ways that simultaneous heating and cooling often happens in commercial buildings. It's important to realize that simultaneous heating and cooling is one of the most wasteful forms of HVAC operations. It's analogous to driving your car with the brakes always on. It's easy to understand that not only does it lead to poor performance, but it will also cost you a lot in unneeded fuel. So why would you allow something similar to continue to happen in your buildings? When allowed to persist, simultaneous heating and cooling can create a two-fold increase in energy consumption in commercial buildings. Simultaneous heating and cooling can cause significant energy waste and it happens when heating and cooling both occur at the same time within the same process. And of note is that the energy waste can become amplified when heating and cooling end up fighting each other. This often happens when there's an overlap in heating and cooling operations and can be caused by a number of things such as mechanical failures, general wear and tear, actuator misadjustment, sensor miscalibration, and frequently, something as simple as overlapping heating and cooling set points can cause it. The main issue that makes this overlap such a problem is that it can create a twofold increase in energy consumption, as one ends up being used to overcome the impact of the other. If it's happening in your buildings, significant energy savings in heating and cooling energy are possible through optimizing the overall HVAC performance to minimize and ideally eliminate any unneeded simultaneous heating and cooling action. Heating and cooling simultaneously is very inefficient and costly, as you're essentially spending money with no value in return. One sure way of eliminating simultaneous heating and cooling is to allow only the heating system or the cooling system to operate at a time. Now we do realize that comfort complaints are what often drive the decision to operate both heating and cooling systems at the same time, such as when one area of the building is complaining of getting too warm, so you bring the mechanical cooling on a bit earlier to make the call go away. Then somebody else complains that they're now getting too cold, so you end up bringing the boiler back on to make that complaint go away. But frequently, those comfort complaints are caused by simple control issues or minor equipment malfunctions occurring out at the local zone level in the building. So even though it may be possible to mask the symptoms by simply dropping the air handler supplier temperature a few degrees and make the hot calls go away, you risk overcooling other areas of the building. So don't overlook the fact that just masking the problem can be very costly energy-wise. Ideally, each complaint should be investigated first and addressed at the root of the problem, which might be as simple as an out of calibration thermostat or a terminal unit damper that isn't working properly. For large cooling and heating systems, such as boiler plants and chill water plants, the use of staging control can help ensure only one system runs at a time. This is usually done by means of cooling and heating system lockout set points, which can usually be found within the building automation control systems. Most modern HVAC systems should be able to maintain full cooling capacity via free cooling from air side or water side economizers up to an outside air temperature of approximately 55 degrees and for some even up to 65 degrees before needing to bring on the supplemental mechanical cooling systems. So free cooling via economizers 
should be the first stage of cooling. And any supplemental mechanical cooling should be locked out and kept off until the outside air temperature is just approaching the point where the economizers can no longer provide sufficient cooling capacity to handle the load. Keep in mind that bringing the cooling system on too early will only waste energy. Then on the heating side of things, again, try to keep the heating system locked out during warm weather and off as much as possible, and especially when the mechanical cooling systems are allowed to operate. The heating lockout control should shut off the heating hot water pumps and boiler system when the outside air temperature rises above its lockout set point. So the heating system lockout should be set to lock out the heating system when the outside air exceeds the point at which the mechanical cooling system is allowed to come on. As we discussed in the previous slide, is typically somewhere between 55 to 65 degrees. But beware, some boilers may not tolerate cycling on and off. So in this case, you can usually shut off the heating hot water pumps and then let the boiler remain on and idling. But nevertheless, it's always good to discuss this with the manufacturers. Now, of course, there are exceptions to this rule, such as in hospitals, where standby heating and cooling capacity is always a necessity. So boiler systems and cooling systems frequently need to run together at the same time. Older hospital HVAC systems were designed with heating and cooling as mission critical and simply ignored how wasteful simultaneous heating and cooling is. Nowadays, modern hospital HVAC system designs tend to capitalize on this need by integrating heat recovery equipment that captures waste heat from the cooling systems and reuses it in low temperature space heating applications as well as for preheating domestic hot water and other process heating needs. But nevertheless, even in older hospital systems, through careful attention to optimized HVAC set points and various reset strategies, these older HVAC systems can be dialed in to significantly reduce the energy penalty of their need for continual simultaneous heating and cooling. By resetting boilers heating hot water temperature set points based on the current outside air temperature, or better yet, automatically reset upward or downward based on the current actual heating loads of the building, you can minimize boiler energy consumption, especially during the warmer months. Lowering the heating water set point reduces the amount of heat that is lost up the boiler stack. Plus, it will likely reduce how often the boiler will cycle on and off, reducing pre and post purge losses. Then on the cooling side of things, using reset strategies to automatically vary the chilled water temperature set point upward or downward based on the current cooling needs of the building helps reduce the cooling energy consumption during cooler weather. And then nowadays, Humidity control in hospitals is becoming more and more important. But overly tight humidity control settings can be problematic. Humidity control often involves some level of simultaneous heating and cooling. However, if the settings are too tight, it can also lead to an excessive amount of unproductive heating and cooling. So always be on the lookout for needless simultaneous heating and cooling and the opportunity to minimize the consumption from any overlapping heating and cooling operations. Let's take a closer look at how transitioning from heating to cooling should work and how to optimize the system settings for overall building performance. The point of this graph is to demonstrate the interrelationship amongst the primary heating and cooling systems of the building. As the outside air temperature rises, you want to focus on transitioning from heating to free cooling and then into mechanical cooling. Always trying to minimize and ideally eliminate any overlap of allowing both heating and mechanical cooling to operate at the same time. 
Now the point where the transitioning begins to happen can be slightly different for each building as well as each system. Some buildings may be able to utilize a dead band period between the operating of the heating and the mechanical cooling systems, where others may not and will do best simply by shutting the heating system off whenever the mechanical cooling needs to be brought on. And then sadly, some will inevitably need to retain a certain amount of overlap during the transitioning period. Most HVAC systems are designed around common engineering standards, but systems oftentimes end up being installed oversized from what the optimal capacities really are. Just because the building was originally set up to operate around those initial design parameters doesn't mean that the systems might not be able to run a bit more efficiently under real world conditions after some effort being made to optimize their performance. The most successful energy savers will experiment as they fine tune the operating parameters, finding the optimal set points that work best for each individual system. Next, reset control strategies help reduce heating and cooling costs by better matching the heating and cooling intensity of the current loads. In its simplest form, the reset control will change the supply water temperature according to the outside air temperature. For boilers, the colder the outside air temperature, the warmer the heating water will be set. For chiller systems, the warmer the outside air, the cooler the chilled water will be set. And now a brief word of caution here concerning boiler systems. If the heating system has a non-condensing boiler, be sure to check with the manufacturer for the lowest permissible water temperature. As a general rule, that temperature is usually considered to be around 140 degrees. In non-condensing boilers, operation below that temperature could allow flue gases to condense, which can damage the flue on the boiler. Also, too quick of a change in water temperature set points could risk thermal shock damage to some styles of boilers. So do your homework first to determine any limitations or concerns. But then once you know these, try fine tuning your system to find the optimal, most efficient, yet safe parameters for your systems. Back before the 1970s, when energy costs were still fairly inexpensive, some HVAC systems were actually designed to simultaneously heat and cool all of the time. Both the multi-zone and the dual duct air handler systems come to mind as systems that by design continuously heat and cool simultaneously. Both of these air handling systems generate two separate flows of conditioned air, one being hot and the other being cold. The dual duct systems distribute two separate streams of air throughout the building via two separate runs of ductwork. Out at the zone level, the separate streams of hot and cold air are then mixed together at a terminal unit which is called a dual duct mixing box. Within the mixing box are dampers that control and combine the hot air with the cold air in proper proportions to discharge a single stream of air at an ideal temperature needed to maintain the comfort set point of the zone it serves. In a similar fashion, the multi-zone air handler system also generates two separate flows of air within the air handler, again, one hot and the other cold. But the main difference is that the two streams of hot and cold air are mixed together just as they exit the air handler. Located at the outlet of the fan are a number of separate zone ducts that each run out to serve their own dedicated zone. A thermostat in each zone sends a signal to an individual mixing damper at the outlet of the fan that mixes the proper proportion of hot air and cold air to derive the temperature of supply air needed to maintain the zone at set point. While these two types of systems are known for providing some of the most comfortable HVAC systems, 
they've long ago fallen out of favor as being extremely wasteful from an energy standpoint. Nevertheless, many still exist out there in older buildings. Yet, both systems can be made to operate as efficiently as possible by the use of carefully selected hot deck and cold deck reset strategies. Also important is to carefully optimize the mixed air set points and the outside air economizer lockout set points as they should be set to maximize free cooling but not overcool the incoming air to any lower than the cold deck set point. Ideally, replacing these old systems with modern single path air handlers is desirable, but if that's not in the budget, a popular energy efficiency upgrade for these systems is to convert them to dual duct variable air volume systems. These days, the most common air handler units we see in commercial buildings are single duct variable air volume systems, typically with reheat capacity capability out at the terminal units in the zone. But here too, if not well maintained and optimized, these two can become very energy intensive as they still have the ability to use simultaneous heating and cooling to achieve their temperature control. Although these systems when operated properly are not nearly as wasteful as the previously mentioned dual duct and multi-zone systems. These VAV systems work by having the air handler cool the supply air just to the point needed to satisfy the hottest zone. Other zones with lesser cooling demand will throttle back the cool supply air via their variable air volume terminal boxes. The VAV box can throttle back the supply air as far as their minimum ventilation airflow set points. Then if the zone remains too cool, they'll begin to reheat the air it's supplying by using a hot water or an electric resistance reheat coil at each zone. And frequently, we see substantial savings develop for both electricity and natural gas as building operators begin to focus on making sure that the air handler supply air temperatures are not set so low that they begin overcooling the areas in the building. As excessively cool supply air temperatures only drive up the need for reheating out in the spaces of the building. Which in hydronic reheat systems will then necessitate starting boilers back up in order to alleviate the overcooling complaints that start rolling in soon after the mechanical cooling starts up. In these VAV systems, a few of the common causes of simultaneous heating and cooling include prop improper control settings, leaky VAV air dampers that allow excessive cool air to pass by them, as well as leaky reheat valves that allow hot water to leak by the valve, as well as sensor calibration issues. All of these can drive up energy waste. A few important optimization strategies for air handlers include the following. Automated supplier temperature reset strategies should be used which are designed to help prevent air handling systems from operating with too low of supply air temperature. The reset strategy will automatically command the supply air temperature set point upward or downward to better maintain optimal discharge temperatures needed to provide sufficient cooling, yet minimize any reheat out of the zones that don't yet need cooling. Then using optimal outside air economizer lockout set points are very important too, as they're designed to maximize free cooling, but then shut the economizer dampers down to their minimum ventilation set points as soon as the outside air rises to the point that it no longer provides any free cooling benefit. And we often find the lockout set points set too low to take advantage of free cooling that's available from the outside air. And yet occasionally we also find it set too high, which ends up bringing in excessively hot outside air, which only increases the cooling load. Then a popular uh, strategy to help ensure the economizer is functioning optimally is to lock out free cooling when the outside air exceeds the return air temperature of the fan system. 
if then if high humidity is a problem in your area, then utilizing enthalpy sensors and dropping out of economizer mode when the enthalpy level of the outside air exceeds that of the return air enthalpy is a preferred method. And economizer mixed air set points are also used to maximize free cooling. But if not reset optimally, they could end up overcooling the mixed air, which only drives up the heating load as the system needs to heat the mixed air up to meet the supply air set point. Mixed air set points should also be reset and should automatically track the supply air set point as it resets. Oftentimes we see fixed mixed air set points of around 55 degrees. And yet when we check the system's supplier set point, we find that it's been reset upwards of 60 to 65 degrees during cool weather. So what good does it do to keep, keep the mixed air set point below the supplier temperature? It, it doesn't. It only increases heating costs as the system needs to heat that overcooled mixed air. And we'll cover that in more detail in our next video where we get a little deeper into sub simultaneous heating and cooling. And then here we have an example of another common cause of simultaneous heating and cooling that's frequently referred to as stat wars. Stat wars happen when neighboring HVAC zones end up fighting each other. This can happen when there's a difference in set points between the adjacent zones. When one terminal unit is calling for cooling, while the neighboring one is then driven into heating in order to maintain its set point. It can happen in reverse too, when heating uh, in a neighboring zone spills over and causes other zones to go into cooling. Cube farm and open plan office spaces with few walls are most susceptible to this form of simultaneous heating and cooling. And this is especially true when the occupants are allowed to change the set points of their local stats to meet their individual preferences, such as when one person feels the need for a quick adjustment of the temperature, they often will go over and crank the thermostat up or down, and frequently they do it a number of degrees at a time. And this results in the local terminal box going into full heating or full cooling. And within a short time, this change begins to spill over into the surrounding zones and driving them into the opposite mode of heating and cooling. The best way to prevent this is to set all of the stats in the area to the same setting and then lock them down so they can't be adjusted by the local occupants. But we know this isn't always an option, especially with lease spaces. So in this case, we recommend trying to limit the range that each stat can be adjusted to just a few degrees. Most modern DDC systems have provisions to limit the range of adjustability of the occupant adjustable thermostats. In this example, we've limited the adjustment range to only two degrees above and below the initial setting. This will help prevent large disparities in temperature between zones and limit sending the boxes to their extremes, while still letting the occupants retain some amount of controllability. So far, We've covered just a few of the common items responsible for causing simultaneous heating and cooling in buildings. And in our next video, we'll cover even more. But for now, how can you determine if these issues and opportunities are happening right now in your buildings? Here are just a few of the actions and tools we recommend for finding your building's energy savings treasures. Get out there and physically survey your HVAC systems looking for things like heating and cooling systems running simultaneously, or heating and cooling valves that are leaking by. And then don't forget to check the air handler economizer dampers, that they're functioning properly and set for maximizing free cooling while not overcooling. Next, utilize BAS trending features available in most control systems these days, and regularly check for the telltale signs. But yet, or yet, better yet, perform an energy treasure hunt in your building with an energy coach. And participate 
in BAS control system reviews with an energy coach. And then recently, automated fault detection diagnostic software tools have become very popular. And they do a great job of continually scanning the BAS systems, looking for signs of misbehaving HVAC systems, as well as for less than optimal operating conditions. In addition, utility bill tracking tools can allow you to keep an eye on overall building energy consumption by tracking the monthly energy bills and plotting changes in performance. When used, make sure they're able to normalize for daily weather conditions, as well as other independent variables that may influence consumption in the building. And then heat maps can be constructed to plot energy consumption via utility interval data. These can provide a glimpse into how the building uses energy during every hour of each day throughout the year, which can be very insightful for identifying system malfunctions as well as opportunities to optimize performance. So this concludes part one of our presentation today. Be sure to view our second video on this subject where we further discuss the impacts of simultaneous heating and cooling, as well as more solutions to help minimize its cost. And remember, for additional energy reducing tips in your buildings, please subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button. And thank you for joining us today.